a greatest joy and privilege really to have been given this uh, opportunity and this great honor to come and meet with you friends um, I was mentioning last night to some of you who were there that I when I was a child I grew up amongst the early believers and they could never conceive they could never believe in their um, in their uh, or use their imagination that one day the believers from all over the world and especially from Europe and America people will embrace this faith because in those days the faith was completely limited to a few countries in the East and uh, when you think of it really one of the greatest uh, proofs of this revelation is that in a small little dirty, filthy prison, a dungeon in Tehran, the light of this great revelation broke down, broke upon that terrible dark dungeon. And who would have imagined in those days that that light will shine all over the world and reach to these remote places as far as Tehran is concerned, the Siachal of Tehran and will illumine the hearts of many many people and bring in a new creation and now you can see the results of this, how the faith has spread, how the power of Baha'u'llah has penetrated into the hearts of mm, peoples all over the world this is something which I really appreciated very much perhaps more than all of you because I remember those days when we were so few and when the faith was limited to just those lands remote far far from here their culture different their background different and now look at what's happened the world has been conquered by Baha'u'llah he has created a new race of men <laughs> and you are the new race of men really and for me therefore it's the greatest privilege really to be able to look into your faces on behalf of the early believers who would have loved to see one European or American believer in their lives they would have loved to gaze upon the face of a person who says I believe in Baha'u'llah coming from the western world uh, well friends I uh, feel that uh, this weekend we are going to be together hopefully to go through some of the most important uh, in my view aspects of our faith It's, it is marvelous to be a Baha'i but we have a great challenge and the challenge is to grow in the faith that our faith may grow day by day this is I think the challenge to every person and if our faith does not grow every day then it's not good it's like a child which is born, it, it, that child must grow. If the child does not grow, then it's not healthy. And uh, this is why Baha'u'llah has mentioned in his writings, he says that we must make our life in such a way that uh, the morning would be better than the previous evening. And tomorrow would be better than today. And we have to feel it. And this is, I think, the challenge to all of us. Perhaps it's easy to be a Baha'i or to become a Baha'i, but it is very difficult to grow as a Baha'i. Look back upon the earlier days, one can feel that one in the faith 
and nobody can say that I've grown enough nobody we as long as we live here we have the scope uh, to grow now I <laughs> I thought to sh perhaps share with you some of these basic thoughts now do not think for one moment that I have got all this um, know-how that I have achieved all of these things all I'm trying to do is from the writings of Baha'u'llah and the writings and the history of the faith and the history of the believers to just bring to your notice what we can do to grow and I feel that one of the subjects which we should first begin with and it's a subject which is really uh, a very important subject which we often do not think about and I'm not talking of Baha'is but especially of the non-Baha'is of, um, of the outside world they seldom, seldom think or care about this subject and that is about our soul because everything begins with the soul really and I think it is time that we paid some attention to find out what is the soul to look at it to see what condition it is what condition is it now really our souls and in order to start the subject I wanted to mention that um, in order to appreciate um, spiritual realities uh, we should look at two things if you want to understand the spiritual principle a spiritual reality you should look at two things and look at them very carefully one is nature and one is the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and when you put the two together then we can understand many spiritual realities nature uh, can teach us an awful lot because God's creation uh, is one entity God has not created two different worlds the spiritual world separate and this and the physical world separate It's not like this he has created one entity the spiritual and the physical world is one and the same and the laws which run through this this creation are the same laws the same laws that run in nature exactly the same laws apply in the spiritual realms the same laws that apply in that that you will find them in nature the same laws uh, are operative in religion every one of the major teachings of Baha'u'llah has its origin in nature every one of his teachings it is very natural religion is very natural the laws that run within the world of man within our world are also have their origin in nature we can learn a great deal from nature but each one of these laws are applied on a higher and higher level as you go higher and higher into the spiritual realms you see a certain law you find in nature that law finds its application in the spiritual worlds and uh, but it has added features to it it has got it's to be applied on a higher level but it is the same law and so if you know something physical if you can understand the law of nature uh, you can understand something of its spiritual laws provided you read the writings I mentioned that because if you don't then you can get lost in your um, efforts to rationalize things and to bring in your uh, rational faculties into it and try to compare things you could get lost but if you read the writings and then look at nature then we can understand many spiritual realities now I will give you an example of this just to give you an example of how the laws of God are the same uh, in, the spirit, in the physical world and the spiritual worlds uh, you know I'll give you one example just an example they all the laws which govern the creation the, the, the creation of a tree for example 
are the same laws as those which um, are given, are used in the creation of man. The same principles, the same laws apply to the two things. They are, they are very much counterparts of each other. A tree and a man. You see, the tree must, will drive its roots down into the ground to receive its sustenance, to get its sustenance. It's from the ground because everything depends on the roots going down into the ground. It depends, its food comes from there. But the tree itself, as if it dislikes the ground, the ground is a very dirty uh, place, it's a low, uh, one of the lowest kingdoms, and uh, the tree has no choice but to receive all its sustenance from this dirty soil. But the tree itself doesn't like the soil. It goes in the opposite direction. Do you notice? It it, as if it dislikes this earth. It moves in the opposite direction. And when it moves in the opposite directions, what happens? It receives the most beautiful thing of all. It receives the rays of the sun. Can you imagine the difference between the rays of the sun and the dirt of the soil? It receives the rays of the sun and as a result of it, it produces beautiful flowers and beautiful fruits. Just because it detached itself from this earth, disliked this earth, it moves in the other direction. If the tree would have said, well, I owe everything to this earth, my food comes from this earth, I love this earth, I'll go into it myself. Well then this wouldn't be a tree. It wouldn't be a tree. It would never receive the rays of the sun. Now this is exactly, can you see the exact parallel with the creation of man? We have to live in this world. It's just like this dirty soil of the, for the tree, this earth, this world that we live in. We have to earn a living. We have to live in this world. But, uh, and we have to get our food, our sustenance our livelihood from this world but the soul does not like this world should not like this world and that it should move it should dislike it it should really um, become detached from this earth and focus its attention in the opposite direction and if we do that if we become detached from the things of this world then the rays of the sun of truth will shine upon us and then our soul will produce beautiful fruits, you see, just like the tree. But if I attach myself to the things of this world, then there is no such a thing as the rays of the sun of truth shining upon me. Now here you see the difference. There's exactly the same principles, but with one difference. I mentioned that the laws which govern the laws which govern the physical nature and the laws which govern the spiritual world are the same. But they have added features. You see, in the tree, in the example of the tree, you will find the tree has no choice but to grow in the opposite direction. It just grows in the opposite direction. That's the way it's made. But we have an added dimension to this particular law given to us and that is choice, free will. We have the choice of either going down into this earth or going the opposite, or growing in the opposite direction. It's up to us to choose. If we choose to go into the opposite direction, then you become spiritual. If you go into this, uh, attach yourself to the things of this world, you become attached to material things. But the choice is up to us. Now this I gave you just an example to share with you how the laws of nature and the laws of higher realms are the same but they have got different um, they have to be applied on different levels now we go back to our own story we wanted to really understand the soul we were going this morning to really try and discover what is our soul so that we can recognize ourselves so that we can um, understand our uh, place in life. Again, in order to understand the soul, we must examine another principle. And that principle is what Baha'u'llah mentions. 
He says that in this life, everything in this physical world is a counterpart of something spiritual. Everything you see in this life is not something which is coming to us in a, in a haphazard way. For instance, we were talking of the tree. The tree is not just something isolated that God has created in this physical realm. You can be sure it has parallels, it has counterparts in all the realms of God. This is only a reflection. The tree is only a reflection of something spiritual in the spiritual world. So everything has a counterpart. And if you can study um, the counterpart of something, you can understand the other counterpart. If you, other, if you study anything in, in nature, you can, f you can study its counterpart in the spiritual realms. Do you see what I mean? For instance, Baha'u'llah mentions uh, that the sun, the sun, is a counterpart of a manifestation of God. What the sun does to this earth, a manifestation of God does to man. So the sun, he says, which is a physical thing, is a counterpart of a manifestation of God. If you want to study the manifestation of God, therefore, to understand something about the manifestation of God, you can study the sun. Really, if you really study the sun, and I mean studying it, you will get a lot of insight into the working of a manifestation of God. Because these two are counterparts. Now, we want to find out what is the counterpart? What is, what is our soul? But you see, the soul is a spiritual entity. It's not a material thing. And if you want to understand our soul, which is a spiritual entity, we have to try, if we could, find a counterpart for it in this physical life. And study that physical thing. If you could find that counterpart and study that uh, physical thing in this life, then we could apply it all its characteristics, the characteristics of its counterpart in the spiritual realm. Do I make myself clear or follow? You see that uh, the soul, as I said, is not a material thing. It's not something you can push it into your body and pull it out of your body. Uh, it's not something you can take it to a laboratory to test it for you. It is, uh, Baha'u'llah says, the soul is an emanation from the worlds of God. An emanation from the spiritual worlds of God. Um, so now, where are we? We want to find a physical counterpart for the soul. There we turn to the writings. There we turn to the writings. And when you turn to the writings, and when you study the writings, it appears to us, that's all I can say, it appears to us. When you read the writings, it appears that the counterpart of the soul, which is a spiritual thing, its counterpart in this physical world, is the embryo growing in the womb of the mother. Whatever happens to the embryo, thank you very much, whatever happens to the embryo growing in the womb of the mother, uh, the same thing applies, happens to the soul. You see, but one is a spiritual thing and one is a physical thing. But now we know everything about the embryo growing in the womb of the mother. And so we can understand from it a lot of parallel points which could apply to the soul. If you could give me a piece of paper, I want to make notes of some of the things I forget. And it comes to my mind and <laughs> sorry for... Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll take the first point. Baha'u'llah mentions that uh, the soul comes into this life, crea it's created by God at the, sign, at the same time of conception. When a child is conceived and the first cell is created in the embryo, physical cell, uh, the soul of man is also created at the same time that the soul of man did not exist before. This is one of the, princ one of the basic truths which Baha'u'llah has revealed to us. It had, did not have an existence before, but that it was created at the time of conception. In the same way that the cell did not exist before, 
but it came into being at the time of conception. And these entity cannot enter into anything. You cannot say my soul entered my body. You cannot use the word to describe it even. It cannot have any relationship, in fact, with the body. But it is somehow associated with it. And uh, Abdul Baha describes it as, uh, so it's, it says it's similar to the, uh, to the association of light in the mirror. The soul in the body is the same thing, he says. It's the same example he gives is like the light in the mirror. Uh, when you look at the mirror, you cannot put your hand in the mirror and pull the light out. You can't touch it. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not in the mirror. The, reflection, the light is not in the mirror. But it is somewhat associated with it, reflected on it. And if you break the mirror, nothing happens to the light. And Baha'u'llah tells us that it's the same thing with the soul. It's associated with us. It's a spiritual thing. It cannot have any relationship with our body other than just being associated. And even you cannot say associated because you cannot use word to describe it in any way. But whatever it is, we know that, let us say, the nearest we can say it's associated with us. Now look at, we can find a lot of similarities here between the embryo growing in the womb of the mother and the soul. A lot of similarities. And from this we can learn a great deal looking again at the writings and looking at nature together. Because as I said, these two things have to go together. Now, one of the similarities is this. That the cell is created uh, at the time of conception. The first cell, if you look at it, there is nothing uh, that you can see in the form of limbs or organs or anything. But that cell has the capacity to grow, to multiply, to acquire limbs and organs. So that after a period of say nine months for instance, it will have a perfect, it, you will have a perfect human being from that cell. It has all the capacities to acquire limbs and organs. But when you look at the cell, there's nothing. Nothing uh, really unusual about it. It's just a cell. Now the soul is the same. When the soul comes to us first, at the time of conception, it has no qualities and perfections. It has no virtues. It has no knowledge. It has no wisdom. But it can, it has the capacity. During a period of say 70, 80, 100 years, that we live in this world, to acquire these qualities and perfections. It's just like the cell in the embryo, isn't it? You see now the similarities? You can see how these two things are, em are, are really counterparts of each other. Another uh, similarity is that when the cell uh, is growing in the womb of the mother, it is not um, designed to live there, to stay there all its existence, all the period of its existence. But that it's only there for a very short period. This is not its home. The womb of the mother is not the home for the body of man. It's not its home. It's only a temporary um, place for it to acquire limbs and organs. That's all it is, pardon. Now exactly the same thing applies to the soul. This world which we live in is really a womb world. It's a womb world for the soul. As if each one of us is pregnant with the soul. Each one of us have the soul in our custody, like shall we say, like preserving it. So that during this period of 100 years, 80 years that we live, or 60 years that we live, uh, our soul may acquire qualities and perfections. But this is not its home. It's a stranger. Really, it's a stranger here. In the same way, sorry, in the same way that the child in the womb of the mother is a stranger there. That's not its place. 
Now, we go further on and uh, we can go and, ex and, and, and find out more similarities. Another similarity is that when they look at the cell growing in the womb of the mother first, um, it is really very insignificant, very insignificant. I mean, a cell is not significant at all and nobody even notices it. It is so unnoticeable. You have to have a microscope to examine it. So, and, and yet, look at what happens nine months later. You have a person. It has developed into a person. It has um, um, all the faculties of a man. See the difference between the first day and the last day? The entry into the womb or the creation in the womb and the emerging from the womb. You see that? The difference between the two stages? And it's the same thing with our soul. The day that we are conceived and the soul is created, as I said, it has no identity, it's no personality. It has no individuality really, but it will acquire this. We acquire qualities, perfections, individuality. And Baha'u'llah says that we will retain our individuality and personalities in the next life. So that you are yourself. It's not something that you lose. You are yourself. And he says that the holy souls will associate with all the souls, the holy souls, the prophets, and describe in the next life all their uh, sufferings in the path of God and all the joys and all the hardships that they have carried on in this life. So you see, it's not something that you will forget. It's something that you, you have an identity, individuality. And Baha'u'llah mentions, now this is a very beautiful thought, that the soul which comes into being um, will last Although it has a beginning, and that is when one is conceived, but it has no end. That it will grow and it will progress as long as God exists in the spiritual worlds of God. So you see what a beautiful thing it is to bring children into the world. So that you have a child coming into the world, a soul which is going to be there till eternity. And another feature, which again is part of the teachings of our faith, the soul is indestructible. You cannot destroy it once it is created. It belongs to the spiritual worlds of God. And uh, at, at whatever stage, at whatever stage you um, dissociate it from the body, whether it is at the time that the child even growing in the womb of the mother, if there is a miscarriage, you cannot destroy the soul. The soul is growing, will grow in the spiritual worlds of God. It has not had the chance to acquire qualities and perfections yet. Uh, but we are told that God will compensate this. So it's not something which is lost. A child who dies at a young age is the same. He has no chance to develop qualities and perfections, but that it will grow through the bounties of God. And God will compensate for the things that he had not been able to acquire in this life. Now, there are other similarities. We go a little further. And we find that our soul, the body, first of all, when we look at the body, we find that, as I mentioned this before, the womb of the mother is not a place for it to live. And the soul also, this is not its place, this home is very much a, a strange place for it, uh, this world. It's like being a bird which is kept in a cage. This is another example that Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha have given in their teachings. That they have, they have given us an example of a bird being kept in a cage. The bird does not belong to the cage. The bird is there in the cage to be fed, to be nourished, so that when the cage breaks, it can take its flight 
into its own realms. And so again we come to the same conclusion that this period of life that we go through, that our soul is in this womb world, really, and it is here to acquire qualities and perfections. To acquire love, to acquire knowledge, to acquire wisdom, to be loving. Another similarity is that when the child is in the womb of the mother, it acquires limbs and organs there, but those limbs and organs are not really needed in the womb world, he cannot use them there. It's not really of, his ben of any benefit to him. Uh, he has, he uses a little bit of it. For instance, he moves his muscles, he uses, moves a little bit of a movement. You see, but he cannot really, it's not a place for using it. You see, the child, for instance, towards the end, has got perfect eyes, but it cannot see because there is no light. But when it is born, all these limbs and organs which were useless to him and he could never conceive what it is for will find some use and he'll begin to use them the eyes now become perfect instruments for seeing you see the phenomena of seeing is a marvelous phenomena when you look at it can you imagine if nobody could ever see if there was no such a thing as sight we would be deprived of knowing something about the light but the light comes and the combination of the two makes us see and there we know one of the attributes of God is the all-seeing God and then we know something of the attributes of God but you see these limbs and organs are not useful in the womb world but it will be useful when it is born here it's the same thing with us with the soul uh, all the qualities and perfections that the soul acquires in this life in, the, in this life of 70 or 80 years as I refer to it I don't know how what is the length of what is the duration of life in this country I don't know how many years people live um, I think people uh, may live uh, longer lives huh than other countries I know in my when I was a young person people used to live to the age of 102 103 you see 110 but in here probably people don't live that long I'm going to tell you a little story came to my mind it's not an authentic story it's one of those pilgrims notes and don't ever take note of it but it is one of those funny things that Shoghi Effendi had a great sense of humor you know and uh, <laughs> uh, he used to tell us that uh, he, he told one of the pilgrims about the American way of life now it's no way to um, belittle anything but he was telling us he was telling this pilgrims he said in a, in a very in a humorous vein he says that uh, the American male works very hard to please his wife now I don't know if it's true or not and uh, he works very very hard and he provides all the facilities and means and comfort for his wife and family and the poor man comes home tired and exhausted and his wife is full of energy and he wants to take her out to go to theaters to do these places and enjoy themselves and so the man of course will go and will oblige his wife and then as a result of all this hard work he dies at a younger age <laughs> and the woman becomes a rich <laughs> person <laughs> travels around the world <laughs> well these are some of the <coughs> stories Often Shoghi Effendi made a lot of uh, humorous remarks. You know, Baha'u'llah had also a great sense of humor. You must not think that he did not have a sense of humor. A great sense of humor. Abdul Baha had a sense of humor. Uh, the believers used to have a sense of humor and they used to, those who had uh, the capacity to come to Baha'u'llah, to Abdul Baha and make some humorous remarks which would um, make them all laugh, you know. This was one of those characteristics. I tell you now that I said about the Americans, let me go every, uh, tell you everything. Uh, Shoghi Effendi had said to another pilgrim something story. <laughs> I've heard this now, I don't know whether it's true or not. He was trying to describe again the various nations and how each nation has its own characteristics. And he said that uh, in America, uh, women dominate over men. I hope you don't mind me saying this. <laughs> they rule over their husbands. In Germany, he said it's the opposite. It's the men who are. He said in England it's quite a 
balance. They said it's not a bad thing if a German, ma if a German, uh, if if an American woman married a German man, and they lived in England. <laughs> So here we are. <laughs> so, well, we were talking about the soul. I don't know what happened. We went out of it. <laughs> but you know, one of those things that I wanted to uh, mention um, about the soul is that uh, we were saying that the limbs and organs which the child acquires in the womb of the mother are not needed there. But in this life, it's the same thing with the soul, really. These qualities and perfections that we acquire, love, unity, brotherhood, kindness, generosity, knowledge, although we can use it in here, in this life, somehow, to our advantage, they are, not, they are really needed in the next life. They are for the next life that we acquire these qualities and perfections. And even if you don't use these qualities and perfections in this life, you still can live. In fact, this is what happens with most people today. People hate, people kill, and they still can live. They don't use those qualities in this life. And they still can live. But the real place, the real use of all these perfections and qualities that we have to acquire, the real use of them is not here, it's in the next life. All these perfections and qualities and virtues that we must acquire becomes like our spiritual limbs and organs in the next life. It will become active. Just like the eyes which are not active in the womb of the mother and suddenly because the light comes up and it becomes a very marvelous instrument, our acquiring of the quality of love for instance in the next life will become just an instrument through which we can progress and if we don't acquire them in here then we cannot uh, use them in the next life because there is another similarity and that similarity is this that the child must acquire limbs and organs in the womb of the mother if it does not it cannot acquire them in this life if you do not have an eye, or if you do not have an, an arm, you can't acquire them in this life. You are handicapped. You will grow, but you are handicapped. And the same thing we understand is true in the spiritual sense. That the soul uh, must acquire these qualities and perfections in this life. That is why God has brought the body and the soul together. That's why he has decreed that we should live a period of 60, 70, 100 years here to acquire these qualities and perfections. So that these qualities and perfections become instruments of growth for us in the next life. And that if we do not acquire them here, we cannot acquire them in the next life. That's all we understand. And remember, we are not trying to say in, this, uh, in, these, in these talks and in these studies that we can understand the soul now. Let me, first of all, I should have said this in the beginning. Uh, don't think that by hearing these talks on studying the writings, uh, no matter how much deeply you study the soul, you will never understand what the soul is. This is only the impressions we get of the soul. These are impressions. This is as far as man in this life can understand the soul. We are limited in our understanding and vision. We cannot understand everything spiritual. We haven't got the tools for it in this life. It's in the next life that we will see the true reality of our souls. But it is hidden from us. Because there is yet another similarity which I want to mention to you. And that similarity between the two things, between the embryo and the soul, is this. That if ever, if ever, the child the child has not got the capacity to understand what a small place he's living in, what a limited place, a dark place he's living in during the period that he is growing in the womb of the mother. He has no capacity to understand that. He has no capacity to understand what a great world expects him to be born into. The vastness, the glory, the greatness of this world, he cannot see. 
impossible for him to see because God has not given him the capacity to understand this. The same God 